Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. This is Chris Cottrell, and this is part two of my Carolina Bays and the Okefenokee Swamp, an end to the means presentation. Uh, and just to quickly recap, you know, we are talking about a, a fragmented comet that the Earth crossed paths with uh, some 12,800 years ago at the onset of the Younger Dryas. And just one of these pieces, just one fragment of this comet, uh, likely from the tail, uh, came crashing through our atmosphere and smashed into the Laurentide Ice Sheet uh, right here uh, at Saginaw Bay in the Great Lakes region of the United States today. Uh, and when this happened, it would have sent just a tremendous amount of ice and steam and, and uh, you know, all that goes along with a, uh, with a major impact like this uh, into the atmosphere. And as these gigantic chunks of ice, some the size of athletic stadiums, came crashing back down, uh, if they landed into the unconsolidated sediment of the coastal plain, which was likely liquefied because of the, the initial shock of this impact, uh, the, the impactors would have um, created these Carolina bays that we see today. And, you know, here's a good example um, using the, uh, the, the 10 millimeter LIDAR. But you can see here we've got uh, just, just bay after bay after bay. Uh, this was a major event. Um, if we if we if they landed onto a uh, hard ground, uh, they likely shattered, and uh, regardless, we still would have been left with just a tremendous amount of of frozen glacial ice all over the East Coast as well as the Midwest. You know, we have the evidence of this in Nebraska, um, and you know what I'm focusing on now is the the after effects. What happened after? these Carolina Bays were formed and uh, all of this rain started coming back down. You know, all of that water had to go somewhere. Uh, and I have a whole video talking about the laws of superposition uh, as they relate to the coastal plain uh, and these humongous flood basins, these humongous floodplains that we see here in the south, uh, you know, just moving a tremendous amount of water very, very quickly and for a very short amount of time, I think. Uh, and so we have these running all the way out to the ocean. And you can see here the ocean was another 100 miles offshore at the time. Uh, so that water traveled a great distance uh, before it got to the ocean. Now, not all of that water made it to the ocean. You know, we do have evidence that uh, some of this water got trapped. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Here's another major river, major floodplain. Uh, this is the Altamaha. This is one of the largest, uh, the, the furthest reaching large rivers that, that we have here draining uh, after this event. Uh, the Altamaha moved a ton of water. Uh, here's Darien down here. And like I said, you know, this is a huge floodplain compared to the river that's in it today. Um, moving a lot of water. Now, I mentioned the Satilla River in, in, in the first video I did for this. Uh, here's the Satilla River. Uh, and the Satilla River is a, a fairly large river, especially as you get down here into the lower coastal plain. Um, but this was, you know, a diversion of, of quite a bit of water. And you can see, you know, uh, how much of that, how much of this um, uh, water is being, you know, driven in this direction. Um, but most of this water here now got blocked by this area called Trail Ridge. Uh, it's just a 130 mile long barrier island, uh, ancient barrier island. And that water got stopped. And, and this whole area became a retention pond uh, for glacial meltwater. Uh, we do have a breach of, of uh, Trail Ridge here. Uh, I believe that this was the birth of the St. Mary's River. Uh, and so we actually see here, and you can see just by looking at this frame, you know, after this breach occurred, you know, just a tremendous of water flowed through here. Uh, it, it looks like it almost cut through, uh, making a new river channel to the sea. Um, but it did uh, start to flow north. And this is now the today St. Mary's River. Uh, but you can see here, you know, how much of this material got got taken and stripped out with this breach, you know, this, this massive movement of water draining a lot of what, you know, this area would have been, you know, a shallow lake. Um, and, and, you know, anything that got washed downstream, you know, with it, anything in this area here that got washed down, collected here. And uh, there was, there was, uh, this is the main drainage of the Okefenokee. Uh, this is the, uh, the Suwannee River. Uh, I did want to point out the Alapaha River right here. Uh, the Alapaha is a huge, you know, it's a huge floodplain. Uh, but if I click off of the, you know, this uh, elevation here, you can see it's just a tiny, tiny, I mean, almost like a drainage ditch now running through this area. It's a very insignificant um, 
uh, drainage compared to the the size of the floodplain that that uh, you know came along with it. So, um, you know, definitely we had a quite a bit of water resting here, uh, and you know, again, I think the timeline does match up. Um, uh, I, I do believe that this is kind of that smoking gun. You know, we we talk about in the last the last segment that the oldest peat that has been dated to the Okefenokee Swamp uh, has only been dated back to about 7,000 years, six to 7,000 years. Um, and that's, that makes sense. You know, if you had an event at the onset of the Younger Dryas that, that collected this much water, uh, it would have maintained that state for a long time, at least throughout the, um, the Younger Dryas. Uh, you know, we had, you know, ice age conditions again for a thousand years. And, uh, so this would have stayed just a mucky mess of a pond, shallow lake for a quite a long time. Uh, and then once the temperature started to warm up, you start to have uh, conditions right for peat development. Uh, and surprisingly, we also see a, an advancement or a, an explosion of uh, the Native Americans in South in Florida, you know, with the uh, the peat, um, the peat burials and things like that, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and that goes right along with this this Okefenokee Swamp peat formation. Um, and so it's been a swamp ever since, you know, for really the past 8,000 years or so, this whole area has just turned into a swamp. And, um, but you know, that, that evidence is still there. That stuff is still there. Um, and, and keep in mind, you know, this is glacial meltwater, you know, this, this, what originally started here was glacial meltwater. Uh, and one of the things that I want to look at later on is evidence for this being, you know, glacial meltwater. And one of the things I want to look at is, um, some isotopes to glacial meltwater, uh, including deuterium and oxygen-18, which, by the way, uh, have been found in large quantities in the upper Florida aquifer, and, and I find that to be quite fascinating. Uh, you know, this is usually a isotopes of, of you know, heavy water from, from glacial melt uh, water, and we are finding it in the upper Florida aquifer, which, which, again, makes sense, especially if we have, you know, such a large area here of just this sitting water uh, for a very long time. Now, another thing that I that I need to point out is that this isn't the only one um, in my conversation with George Howard uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, I was just kind of highlighting this. I haven't really talked about it uh, with anybody. And um, and I was t telling him of this, you know, what I think about the Okefenokee Swamp. And it immediately made him think of one of his projects. Uh, he does own a, uh, a wetland restoration company and uh, in North Carolina, and um, it, it instantly made me think of Angola Bay. Uh, they had a project on Ang Angola Bay, and um, he commented that, you know, this should be an area that has tons of Carolina bays, and there's not any there. Uh, however, <laughs> they are finding, you know, 8,000-year-old peat. Um, so, again, I think that we have pockets of these areas where um, the water just didn't drain off like it like it did in some of these other areas. I mean, look at this, you know, the Cape Fear Valley just drained a tremendous amount of water. Uh, but this area over here must probably sat pretty stagnant for a while. And, uh, and you know, at least through the Younger Dryas. And um, that's where I'm at with it now, guys. You know, like I said, I think that this really could be that smoking gun that we're looking for. We have a definitive date of peat formation uh, being well within the Holocene. Uh, how did that water get there? How did the Okefenokee Swamp form? Uh, you know, that's this is all stuff that that is going to tie this all together. You know, the the um, the uh, the isotope data. Um, you know, this is just it just it it all points back to Saginaw Bay being a major impact at the onset of the Younger Dryas. And, uh, and I really think that that's where we're headed with it. Um, if you see this and, and you agree with me, or if you think that you have some stuff that you can add to it, you know, please feel free to email me. Um, you know, I'm willing to work on this with anybody. Um, I, I, you know, this is something that's been in the back of my mind for quite a while. And I've decided, you know, I really just can't just sit on it. Let's just go and get it out there. And, uh, you know, cause I think that this could be a, a big deal. Uh, so anyways, guys, you know, like I said, you know, if, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you think I'm just completely out there and this is way off, let me know that too. You know, I, I definitely take the uh, constructive criticism and, uh, and we'll use that. So, um, but this is where I'm at with it now, guys. And, and, and I really think that we could be onto something. Uh, so, so let me know what you think. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time. Bye.